iman wile accident et raba nashe layati mut pasul taqa chakli et la nisyane bidane cases et injury law u bi al paye qrima in atin yan kulpatid beta khizmokhun yatane et lokhun buqare maghburun el minyan el telefon 8 arpa shawa u 8 tre u 5 khaishta yan tukun bit injuryrights.com Shimmi ile Tony Kalagorakis ki am zimmen lishan khilia dima Welcome to the Syrian National Council of Illinois where we provide home care services for the elderly 60 years and older. For over 20 years, ANCI has worked closely with the state of Illinois to strengthen and expand our home care program. We currently service the Chicagoland area, including Cook, Kane, and DuPage counties. If you are interested in finding out more about our home care services, please visit us at our Chicago or Streamwood office. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so this is the purpose, we're gonna, take, uh, we're gonna change gears here. Um, we talked about you know, building up our community, but now we're talking about how to create our community more healthy. So with the purpose of advancing public health, to create a more healthy, in the literal sense, a nation, uh, you know, we're convening today with this panel of specialist physicians. Um, you know, we can't have a successful nation without it being healthy. And so we have come together with this shared uh, education and dedication to improve the well-being of our community from our respective specialties. Um, of course, I want to acknowledge that we do have a lot of health professionals in the audience, and our goal is to include all of you guys at one point in the near future. So without further ado, we'll start off with Dr. Nathan Abraham, uh, ophthalmologist. Shalom alaikum. Shalom to with you. I want to extend my welcome and my gratitude for the AANF to put the, putting on this convention and for the Assyrian advisors to help organize all of this. So we're going to have some fun today and we're going to learn some stuff. My name is Nathan Abraham. I'm an ophthalmologist in solo practice in Los Angeles, about two hours away from here. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that I hear commonly, treat commonly, and some important topics within eye care. So I'm the eyeball guy. Now. To get it out of the way, the most common thing that I treat and the thing that people complain about the most has to do with dry eyes. Now, dry eye is an umbrella term, meaning there's a bunch of things that go into why people's eyes feel dry, sandy, tired, itching, you name it, I've heard it. And so to understand dry eye, we have to understand the tears and how are tears made. Tears are, in this, does this thing have a red button? Uh, the green button. Oh, the green, okay. Tears are made from two things, water and oil. The water portion is actually made in these glands right up above the brow called the lacrimal glands. And that's what actually is the majority of tears. But equally important is this very important lipid or oil layer that's made by very important oil glands that are all along the eyelash margins. Probably the most, thing, the most important thing you can take from my talk today is understanding that these oil glands produce the oil that insulates the tears. And we gotta make sure that we keep those glands clean. So there is a condition called blepharitis, also called meibomian gland dysfunction, where there's a lot of acne around those eyelash oil glands, so the tears are mostly water. What does water do? It runs down your face or it evaporates, so it doesn't really lubricate. Now, 
Full disclosure, uh, the next slide is a little bit cringe, so viewer discretion is advised. But I wanted to bring this because this is how important and prevalent blepharitis is in treating dry eyes. So this is actually a patient's, oh, it's not, something's wrong with the video here, let's try again. Oh, it's too bad, it's all washed out, but anyway. I was gonna show you what happens when you don't clean your eyelashes and all that oil builds up in the glands and it becomes like worms, like snake worms. And it's pretty dramatic, but I wanted you to know that because that's actually, let's see if we can see it. It's really washed out, but basically I'm squeezing here and you can actually see like snakes, like oil come out here. Okay. And that should be the consistency of olive oil, not butter, but anyway. Blepharitis and dry eye, if left untreated, leads to a very common thing that many of us have experienced, and that is styes. Now, the reason I started with blepharitis, dry eye, because this affects all age groups, children all the way to adults. So styes are basically when one of these oil glands gets fully clogged and becomes really inflamed, infected, painful. I think many of us have been there. So why are we talking about this? Because the treatment is extremely important. Now, lubricating the eyes with preservative-free artificial tears is the first step, but that's a band-aid. That doesn't actually solve the problem of dry eye and blepharitis. What does is to clean the eyelashes. That way you can get the oil flowing on the eye, lubricating the eye, and you know, relieving symptoms of dry eye. So we recommend using Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo or over-the-counter eyelid scrubs to really clean the eyelash margins. That, this is probably the one thing I talk to patients the most about in my clinic. Now after that, we gotta find a way to get the oil to start flowing. We accomplish that by warm compresses. There's many different ways of doing it, but the point is to heat up the eyelid oil glands to get the oil flowing like it's supposed to. Now the good thing about what I do, and one thing I love about it, is I got something for everyone. Everybody in this room at some point will need an ophthalmologist. So there's things we do for children, kind of middle-aged people and older people, and that's kind of how I've broken down the last part of our talk. So for vision correction or things that I worry about, from birth till about 20, the main thing is up-close work, mainly iPads, screens, everything, where children's whole world has now become within a foot of their face. Now, why is that important? Because that can actually create myopia or nearsightedness, making it so that people will need glasses forever. Now, for me, that's called job security. But for our community, that's not a good thing. So the importance of this is to limit screen time, especially the younger kids from birth till about two or three. They should be getting almost little to no screen time, if you can. And the other thing is to kind of pull the screens back so they're not right in front of their faces. So that'll help prevent the progression of myopia. Now, the next category, I use this guy, Juanca, as an example. From 20 to 40, what is the best thing I can do for patients? And that is to get them out of glasses and contact lenses, because who likes glasses and contact lenses? Not me, all right? So LASIK, LASIK is the gold standard of laser vision correction. What we do is we actually reshape the cornea to get all the glasses prescription out of the eye so people can see and enjoy their life glasses and contact lens free. Dr. Abraham, I went to a LASIK surgeon, actually I went to you, and you told me I wasn't a good candidate for LASIK because my prescription is too high or my corneas are too thin. Or I went somewhere else and they told me, ah, we can't help you, just wear glasses and contacts. Can you help me? The answer is nowadays, yes. We now have what's called an implantable contact lens. Contact lenses usually go on the eye, but we now have a surgical procedure where we actually put a contact lens inside the eye for people that have extremely high myopia or very thin corneas that we can't perform LASIK on. So nowadays we basically have something for almost everyone to get them out of glasses and contacts. The next Juanca is who represents those from 40 to 60 years old. He's closer to 40 than 60, okay? <laughs> All right. But this is the one condition that rest assured every single human on planet Earth will develop and that is called presbyopia. Now what is presbyopia? It's basically when you 
lose the ability to read up close. You lose the autofocus ability of the eye. And that has to do with the lens, which is a structure inside the eye. It starts to get stiff. It's one of the few things in life that gets stiffer when you get older. But anyway, um, this is a big problem. <laughs> and the bigger problem is we don't have a good solution for it. Whoever discovers a good solution surgically for presbyopia will revolutionize the field of medicine and eye care because everybody will develop it. Now, again, I don't have any good solution. Some people will do LASIK for one eye near, one eye far, but we really don't have a gold standard surgical procedure. Now, the last category is for our older family and friends and patients that now develop cataracts. Now, in Assyrian, we call it miyakwara, like white water. But basically what it is, is it's a clouding of the natural human lens, the same one that stopped autofocusing and helped you not to read anymore. Over time, it gets cloudy. And that's what a cataract is. And it causes blurry vision and glare and halos, like you're looking through a film. And so the treatment for cataracts is actually cataract surgery, where we remove the old lens, called the cataract, and replace it with a brand new, man-made, crystal clear lens. This is probably the most exciting part about what I do because technology is constantly advancing and changing. And nowadays, we have premium or advanced technology lenses that get people out of glasses completely after cataract surgery. And this is a nice picture of the lens that I like to use. It's the only trifocal lens on the market where before cataract surgery, everything is like yellow and blurry. Life is not fun. When we do cataract surgery and patients say, no, doctor, I'm okay with reading glasses, and they just use the standard lens, this is kind of what their vision looks like, where distance is clear, but intermediate and near, not so much. So you're kind of stuck in glasses. But with this technology, we can now have three points of clear focus, near, intermediate, and far. So those are what's, what are called premium lenses. So I want to thank you for your time. And do we, are we going to do questions at the end, Joe? Okay. 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 Thank you, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiffany Tadavosian, and I'm a board-certified internal medicine physician. So I specialize in adult medicine, and I see and treat patients that are 18 years and older. I'm currently practicing here in California, and I'm partner of Kaiser Permanente. As part of my job, I have two different roles. My primary role is actually working as a primary care doctor, and that's what we're going to talk about today because it is what's near and dear to my heart. And it's actually what's going to be applicable to everyone in the audience today. But I also work um, ur urgent care shifts, different shifts of the week or month. Urgent care is a very different lifestyle than my office setting. We see high, a high number of patients per hour. We deal with anywhere from acute to chronic cases. We do some emergent cases and procedures. Um, so between the two fields of practice, there really is never a dull moment. But my focus is primary care because that's what I love the most. So on my primary care aspect, at my office setting, I currently have just over 2,500 patients and growing um, under my direct medical care. So these are patients that I am actually involved with their daily medical needs and any routine follow-ups they have. So why I wanted to mention and focus on primary care is because everyone in this audience, including myself, needs a primary care doctor. So if there's anyone who has not yet established with one, regardless of your age, regardless of even if you don't have any medical problems at this time, please do establish with one. Um, we take care, we're basically the physicians that will watch and take care of you your whole life. We care about the health of every organ in your body, including the eyeballs, <laughs> but we're, it's because we're managing most of your chronic medical uh, conditions. So. One thing that we do in addition to kind of doing your acute and chronic conditions on our daily visits is your physical exam. So this is something that everyone in the audience also needs to please schedule with your doctor once a year. That's why we call them annual physicals. It actually doesn't matter what insurance plan you have. You can have a PPO, an HMO, you could be under Medicare. It doesn't even matter what state you're living in. Your insurance company actually covers this very thorough visit. And we do do a lot for you. So it's a free visit with us. Why not? You get to see us, and we get to order a slew of tests on you. 
Now, I wish I had the time to go through all of them. I don't. But I was going to focus on a few of the important labs that I unfortunately see a lot of abnormals in. So I wanted to make sure these are labs your doctors are ordering or that you understand them. And at the end, we're going to briefly go over some of the important screening tests, the cancer screening tests, that you will either be eligible for now or in the near future. So for the, oops, that's the second. For this um, first test that I wanted to talk to you about, it's referred to as the hemoglobin A1C. If you've never had this tested, write it down. Uh, make sure your doctor's testing this. It's basically the test that will determine if you are a pre-diabetic, a diabetic, or neither. Now, from the time I graduated medical school until today, which was really not that long ago, this guideline has already changed. So you might have been considered normal in the past, but now um, you might be either pre-diabetic and diabetic and not be aware. Because now we refer to pre-diabetes if this number is between 5.7 to 6.4. This was considered normal in the past. And now you're classified as a diabetic if the test is repeated to show on two consecutive tests as 6.5 or higher. Now this test does not need to be fasting. So even if you tried fasting the night before and you didn't eat, it's too smart of a test. <laughs> you don't need to. It averages three months of how you've been consuming. So if you like sweets and treats, this is going to trigger this test. Even if you don't have a sweet tooth, it actually incorporates our carbohydrate in um, intake, unfortunately. So if you do consume a high carb diet, it's possible that you could be prone to becoming a diabetic even without a family history. For the next um, slide that I'm going to be talking about, it's the renal function test. So this is our kidney blood test. There's a lot of different tests in regards to this, but I was trying to make it a little bit more basic because here the GFR, which is what our filtration rate, is important to understand. You don't have to memorize this chart. I just kind of left it there to kind of explain that unfortunately, even in my young patients, as young as 18 years old, because that's the youngest I'll see, um, most people are not within normal renal function and they have no idea. So if your GFR, which is your filtration rate, and this is a routine test, your doctor will order it, you don't have to ask for this, but if your GFR is greater than 100, you're normal. If it's greater than 90, you might be normal, most cases are, but if you're not aware and you're leaking any protein in the urine, you're already considered in one of the CKD stages. That means chronic kidney disease. A lot of people are in these different stages and they have no idea. And again, this is even across the board with my young patients. But if you work with your doctor, you go see them, they can let you know where you're at and they can come up with a plan for you. Now there's two big offenders of why our kidney function is not staying in normal range. One is dehydration. So even if you're not thirsty, if you're not drinking at least 64 ounces of water a day, that's about eight cups of water or four water bottles minimum, you're considered dehydrated. And if your kidneys are not affected now, they will be in the near future. So please hydrate. Um, the, but the other big offender is the NSAIDs. So these are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Unfortunately, most of these are overused because they're over the counter, a good chunk of them. So that would be Advil, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, naproxen, naproxen, and prescription meloxicam, which is commonly prescribed by many doctors across the board. These are basic, you know, routine kind of medications, but if you're not in normal range and you're on these medications, you need to either decrease or temporarily avoid depending on which stage of renal um, disease you're at. You don't have to worry if you later go do your blood test and you find out your GFR is 70, and then you start to panic because you're like, oh my goodness, the doctor told me that I'm like in CKD stage three, I'm, I'm gonna get end up in dialysis. It's not necessarily true. It can momentarily go down. We can get your kidneys to go up if you're just working with us and seeing us from time to time. So that's for that test. Um, the other important um, test is vitamin D. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like a lot of doctors are routinely ordering this. We do at our office. My patients get a very thorough assessment when they leave. Um, it's not that you have to have it always tested, but if you can get one baseline test, this one's important. It's actually more important, not just for your bone health, as most people thought. It's good for your cardiac health. I'm sure a cardiologist will later <laughs> indicate that. It's also good for your immune system, and it's even good for fertility levels for both males and females. 
the lab will say that you're normal if your vitamin D is at 30. As a physician, I like that number higher. So it should be around the 40s. Um, but again, we can help you get it there. Most people are okay with over-the-counter vitamin D supplements. We all should be on one, most likely. If I drew everyone's lab in the room today and you're not on a supplement, you're most likely low or very low normal. Um, and some people need prescription level. So please remember this test. Um, okay, so the last few slides, they'll be very quick. I know we're on a time crunch. This is about the cancer screening tests. So we're gonna start off with the males in the audience. If there's any male in this room that is 40 years or older, and you don't know what a PSA test or your doctor didn't have a conversation to you about this, you need to speak to them, please. This is how we assess your prostate health. Now it's referred to as the prostate specific antigen test. Don't worry, it's a non-invasive test, it's just blood work. But unfortunately it's not routinely done because our requirement as physicians is to make sure it's a shared decision making. Some males don't wanna know, they don't want it tested. There really is not too much of reason not to, to be honest. It is true that most cases of prostate cancer in males are very slow growing, and if a male was to develop prostate cancer, it would be so slow growing that they say it wouldn't affect his life. However, there have been enough very aggressive cases that are occurring in very young males before they develop any symptoms, and if they just got this simple blood test, they would be aware of what their range is in. I like to um, do this on my patients every year for those who are willing. Some patients I have to test more frequently if I'm seeing that they're starting to have jumps in this test. The next two slides are for the females in the audience. So the cervical cancer screening test is a test that's mostly conducted by OBGYN doctors. However, there's quite a few primary care doctors that are trained in this, somewhat specialize it, because we do this during our physicals for women are due. I do do these tests for my female patients that are eligible and interested. Now women, don't worry, it is not a yearly exam as most people thought or as it used to be done. As long as you're having normal results from the ages of 21 to 30, you can get this done every three years. We won't make you do it every physical. And then as long as you continue to have normals women when you're age 30, it goes every five years. The next female screening test is the mammogram. So mammograms are very important, ladies. Please make sure if anyone in this room is 40 and older and you have not scheduled your first uh, mammogram, you're eligible at this time. Please do so, there's really no reason not to. Now there might be females in the audience that might have um, some symptoms or they might have a very, very strong family history of breast cancer. If that's the case, do not wait till you're 40. Go to your physicals. We bring these questions up. You don't have to remember most of this. We talk about these during our appointments. And if we need to screen you sooner with the mammogram or a different test or other modalities, we will. And then I save the best for last. Everyone's favorite. This is for both males and females, by the way. The colorectal cancer screening test. <laughs> this is a very hard one. For, I, will spe I will go over time if I have to. It don't matter if I have to sit in that room with my patients to try to convince them. Please don't ignore this test. It actually became, so if there's anyone who's 45 now in this room, male or female, and you didn't schedule this yet, you are overdue by today's guideline. A couple years ago it changed. It's no longer done at age 50. Way too many cases of colon cancer have been occurring, unfortunately. Now, I want to explain something, because I have a lot of new patients that come to me and tell me, oh, I do those stool tests, and they're all normal. I'm not doing this thing. And what I always try to clarify is do not depend on those stool tests. They definitely miss colon cancer. You could have repeatedly normal stool tests and they don't know that you have colon cancer. And the reason is because what we're all most likely growing in our colons right now, because it's pretty much on most people's colonoscopies, are polyps. They're silent. Unfortunately, you don't know they're there. You can't even test it. Like if you get a CT scan, you're not gonna see the polyp. CT scans will pick up when you're already too late and you have colon cancer. Stool tests, even the ones that say they pick up on polyps, please don't rely on those. But these polyps, even though they're mostly benign in our colon, the vast, these days, from what I'm noticing, is almost the majority seem to be precancerous. So what does that mean? 
If you didn't do this, and right now we have a precancerous polyp in our colon, which is a high chance, unfortunately, these days based on our diet or potentially genetics, it will turn into colon cancer. And there's no reason that anyone in this room should ever develop colon cancer because we're good with this exam. How often you will do it will be depending on what your results are. Once you get it done, you have to do it every so many years. You won't feel a thing. You're sedated. Best 15 to 20 minutes sleep of your life, and then it's done. Okay, and that's it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tiffany. You might have you might have saved some lives today. Abitun basim katiyutun shemi ila Richard Zumelan. Udi chemendi chita bain vaodin vachemendi bain vahamzim abasid. More my journey. Perzayin tem yamavate babavai lacha. So chemendi bain mentanin vaked. Not only would benefit you maybe from for the students, but also mothers, fathers, grandparents. So. Um, I like Afisi. This is Budaitanamuila. This is Lamasu. It was at the gates of Nimrud. I painted this painting and I, I put it right in front of my exam rooms. Get a Nasha Bitaina. To me, I know they're entering Assyria because my brother and I share this office. So when they're coming here, it's my brother and myself, Christopher, and Abir Zayona. Sometimes they know what it is, most of the time they don't, but we know that they're in our land now. <laughs> So uh, who am I? I'm a board certified facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon. I specialize in face and nose surgery. I'm putting my timer on not to go too long. Um, I'm also an ENT doctor, so ear, nose, and throat. So Nasha Bakshav and I just do nose jobs, rhinoplasty, that's the same thing. But I also do uh, nasal breathing work, and I used to do a lot of facial reconstruction. Now I still do some as a part of a clinical instructor at UCLA. I donate my time um, to teach residents. I also donate my time to teach a fellow every year, uh, and that's to really teach them how to do my surgeries really well. Um, I published uh, over 50 peer-reviewed uh, articles and book chapters, and I lecture across the nation and the world. Um, sorry, this format isn't working as well as I'd like, but this is a family that loves medicine, science, and business. Um, my brother is in the office with me. He's not here today. He's an oculoplastic surgeon. Alan Turnin, if you would stand up. He's my brother-in-law, my sister's husband. Charlene, you can stand up too. <laughs> Alan, Alan has done amazing things this year. I hope he will speak at the next convention because he started off as an anesthesiologist. In the past two years, he pivoted and now is doing pain management as well and is building a whole new practice. Medicine is amazing because you can start a new career, basically, mid in, in any, any time you want, and Alan's doing that and he's succeeding. Uh, you'll see in the middle of this photo, that's Rhonda in the long um, animal print dress. She is a uh, dentist, my brother's wife, and she has now at least, she has three dental offices that she owns and runs, and she is a um, uh, mama, mama Mom I don't even know how to say it. It's a mom that's an entrepreneur. <laughs> and um, I, my, my father is a PhD, and he's a PhD in chemistry. There's a picture of us in um, Turkey together. He came with me to watch me speak. But somebody I want to mention. <laughs> mom, can you stand up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is my mom. So, mom, tur turn around and see my mom. So guys, at the, at the core of every family, you guys know, is a mother, a very strong mother, a mother that pushed us very, very hard, not just to find the right people, because this family is created largely because of my mom's uh, strong will and ambitions, but also pushed us every day as kids. So as parents, you know, do what you want to do. If you're interested in music, art, do this and that. My mom was like, no. Like, you guys like need a degree. You guys need to succeed. You guys need to get higher education. She saw I was interested in piano. She knew I loved it. She cut off my lessons because she didn't want me to be a musician. And honestly, I might have been if she didn't stop me. So thank you, Mom, for that. But honestly, at the, at the core of a family like this, I believe, is someone who's pushing hard and has high expectations. And don't, when you meet my mom, she's very nice. But with her kids, she's militant. Don't be fooled by her. She is extremely strong. So um, we come from Urmi, um, so what is Urmi for all of you who don't know? Urmi is a, very, uh, is, a, is a city west of Urmi Lake in northwestern Iran. Before that we were in Mosul. And this is Urmi Lake on the bottom left drying up, similar to the Salton Sea about two, mile, two, uh, two hours away, which actually is almost the same latitude. And on the top right is St. Mary's Church. 
So when I made this sign in our new office for Chris and I, I put Zamelin on top of Beverly Hills because on the left you'll see that's Urmi and that's Beverly Hills. So whenever people come, I say, oh, this fancy last name, Zumal, Zumal, and they say, they don't know that it's some li this small village in Iran that's it's basically putting next to Beverly Hills. So <laughs> to me, I always laugh when I see people pick, take pictures in front of it because I'm like, they have no idea what I just did right there. <laughs> so Urmi, Urmi and Anaheim, Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, they're all at the same latitude, same weather pattern. For all of you who don't know that, that's why like we are so comfortable here and we do so well here. We see some more Mishnah in the back, Ramika and Ben. Ben's also a doctor, Tamarezi, and uh, same village. So why medicine? So let's pivot to my career. Why medicine? Why plastic surgery? So I thought for some time I was going to do um, neurosurgery maybe, but the first time I saw rhinoplasty, a nose job, I was like, wait a second. You can sculpt somebody's face. You can, you, can, you can rearrange somebody's face and actually get paid for it. So to me, that was very, very obvious. So it involves helping people. It's human sculpting. It uses physics and math, architecture. It's a teamwork atmosphere. Uh, there's always teaching every day. And every case and every day is unique. And to me, that was, that was like, I couldn't believe that this was actually a job. To me, it's not a job. So uh, I know there's some students here. I want to talk about how we can achieve our greatest potential and how I achieved my greatest potential and the steps necessary. In fact, I met a young girl who drove all the way out here from um, Arizona, um, and she's pre-med, and she asked me, um, what, what, what are the keys to get to where you got to? Because I want to do the same. All right, well, here we go. The first step is you have to open the doors, and this is for the parents too. So if your kids are getting, if kids aren't doing this kind of stuff, then you need to whip the, get out your whip like Bella did, figuratively. She never really whipped us, but you need to get it out. You need to get your kids going. You need to push them hard. Uh, I don't know if my young cousin Noah's here, but I push him all the time, and I tell him you got to be a killer in school. You got to really get the good grades. You got to get the best test scores, and you got to do at least one extracurricular strong. I did tennis. I did music. I did theater. I did a lot of things, but the most important thing I did was uh, get the high scores humanly possible because without that the doors will close on you college is the next step you want to gravitate a little bit towards your passions but not fully if your passion is reading books and you want to be an English major that's fine but maybe make it as a minor and do something that will allow you for sure to guarantee a job at a certain point right if you like music minor in music major in something that will get you for sure a job and do like I do do music and art on the side no problem uh, extra quick activities for sure, join a club, um, do some research, things that things will help you um, do it. But the most important thing is if you don't have a good GPA and if you didn't get a good MCAT, I'm sorry, but you're, the cards are stacked against you and it will, it will be extremely difficult for you. So you have to sacrifice and get the good grades. I'll talk about that later. Medical school is only four years. Everybody will tell you if you're young or your kids are, are young and they're telling, oh, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a dentist, I want to be, they're going to say it's too hard, you can't do it, this and that. My brother-in-law will tell you all the stories that people told him when he was trying to be a doctor of how everybody told him not to do it. Everybody told him it's too hard, you're not going to be able to do it. I can tell you, medical school is highly stimulating, it's highly enjoyable, and has a very low failure rate, which means once you're a doctor, once you're in medical school, you will be a doctor. You will be a doctor. There's absolutely no way you won't, and I can tell you. So don't fear it. You just have to get in. I went to Northwestern. This was in Chicago, best four years of my life. Actually, these were probably even better. Residency, so once you're done with medical school, you're not actually done training. You actually have to do something like a specialization. Like O'Hare is a dermatologist. She did how many years after residency? Uh, medical school, four, right? Five. So five years after residency, and you guys did four years, Three. Tiffany? Three? Seven. Seven, okay. So there's a range. but. This is not school in the sense that you're in a classroom for like three to seven years. You're actually on the job. You're, it's school meets work. So you're actively taking care of patients. You actually get paid. This is a salaried position. It's not a lot, but it's enough to get by. And you'll actually do surgery if you're a surgical uh, resident. And it's intense mentorship by very famous doctors from, from your university. And it's extremely stimulating. And I'll tell you, if you ask me the best years of my life, I mean, I've a, I, I'm very happy with, with life these days and, and so on. But I can tell you that this is the most fun I ever had, residency. And it was in New York City, which made it even better. Um, fellowship. Guys, this is not the way I write things. I think when you con I converted from... Um, 
uh, Apple to um, you know PowerPoint in in this, it, it's totally screwed up the formatting. So if you think that I'm, I function based on this, then I, <laughs> I I don't think I don't think I would have made it, guys. I'll be honest. So fellowship is subspecialized medical training. It's you don't have to do it, right? So I did it because I did ENT, I had a neck surgery, and I wanted to do more focused work in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. I did that at the University of Washington. Um, it's more it's extreme specialization. I really did a lot of basically uh, facial reconstruction, rhinoplasty, and aging face work, uh, and that's um, that helped me get ready for a practice. So what's the total then? The total is 10 years after college. Sounds like a lot, right? Well, I can tell you, it goes by really quickly. It's not the horrible experience people say it is. I got to live in four different cities across the country. I even did a summer of, uh, re of lung cancer research in the south of France. This is the University of Montpellier in south of France, um, which is the oldest medical school in, in Europe. And I made hundreds of friends throughout the country and the world. It was an intense life experience at the hospital and outside. It was fulfilling every single day, and we had new challenges every day. So if anybody tells you or your kids or your friends, don't go to medical school, it sucks, this and that, the other, they don't know what they're talking about. Because I not, honestly, I, I I would, it, it, would, it, would have, it would have been a real shame to not have done what I did. And, and I'm sure you guys agree too. So what, what, is it, what are the things that it takes to get there? It sounds easy, right? Well, it's not actually that easy. Life, life will not come to a total stop, but you will need to prioritize your time. You will need to stay no to friends and sometimes family. Um, meaning like, I need to stay home and study. I can't go to this party. I can't go to convention. Yeah, you need, you, need to, you need to do what you need to do. You will need to sacrifice your social life, and that's okay because you're building something. This is me in the operating room. I'm, I'm operating across my fellow. Um, she's with me for one year, and I teach her how to do all the surgeries that I do, and behind me is a is a well-known plastic surgeon from Washington DC, Dr. Chang, and he came to visit me from across the way. And it's 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 to me worth every sacrifice. This is just some stuff somebody put together for me. Thank you. So, you know, anything worth something in life requires sacrifice. And if you want something that's that's great, it's not going to come easy. But um, the the ride is enjoyable. It's not it's not the uh, the black hole. You know, end of the world process. Um, I, like I said, the best ten years of my life were those years between college and when I started my practice. So don't be discouraged. Don't let your kids discour be discouraged. Uh, we need more doctors in the Assyrian community. We need more professionals. We need more PhDs. We need more dentists. We need more lawyers. This isn't the only job I say is great for me. It's perfect, but you know the Assyrian community needs to step it up. The parents need to really put more pressure on their kids to, to get the higher degrees and, and do greater things, and uh, we uh, we need to all focus on that. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to try to squeeze this all in the next few minutes. I know we're kind of running late to our next talk, um, so. What I'm going to talk about, well, this is not as glamorous, but, you know, uh, I had a lot of training in cardiology, and uh, Richard kind of brought that up. You know, seven years, I was thinking about it. You know, would I do it all over again? I don't know, but, you know, I, I'm happy where I'm at right now. Um, you know, maybe I would become a piano player, but, uh, but you know, from, the, from my extensive training, you know, the reality is that for me as a cardiologist, um, I'm studying and seeing patients primarily that have already succumbed to disease. And, and cardiac disease is, is, is a very difficult disease to manage because of the many comorbidities people develop from it. Um, so, you know, seeing the extensive heart surgeries and open heart surgeries and stents and heart failure, it has a huge impact you know, on, on someone's livelihood, you know, like from mobility issues, from being able to tolerate any activity, from being here today. And so, uh, and, and unfortunately I see the same kind of lifestyle factors that, that continues to persist despite being diagnosed with, 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 with these diseases. Um, and a lot of the times, the reason why we're not doing, as a cardiologist, we don't do a great job is because of time restraints within our office um, and overall apathy and, you know, easy just to push pills on our patients. Um, and so we don't really address the underlying root cause. And this is what I'm, I want to kind of touch on uh, during this presentation. 
So just a quick disclaimer, um, I don't know all your uh, medical histories and backgrounds, so you should definitely consult with your primary care provider. Um, since I don't know all the nuances, but I'm going over general themes that pretty much uh, you know, applies to all of us. Uh, so what's the point of this talk? So I want to talk about how big the problem is, how big the problem is of cardiovascular disease, what the root cause is, what are some risk factors. We're going to explore some of the evidence-based recommendations. I'll keep that short. And you know, how to practice prevention with your family and friends in our community. So let's start off with just the basics. You know, uh, it's, it's, it is in multiple choice format, but this is the answer is all of, all, all of the above. You know, this is how we assess one's risk for cardiovascular disease. You know, it's blood pressure, detecting the di diabetes, as Dr. Tiffany mentioned, checking cholesterol levels. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the coronary calcium score because the insurance don't cover it, so a lot of providers don't offer it, but it's, it is a huge vital in, uh, outlook on, on, our, on our risk. And, and of course, our age plays a huge factor. So how big is the problem? One in three. One in three adults in our country have at least one type of heart disease. All right, that's a lot, 33%. And this could include high blood pressure, which is an early onset of heart disease, having actual blockages in our, in our heart vessels, heart attacks and strokes, and even heart failure. So this is a schematic. Uh, the main importance of this slide is that it starts at a young age. We start developing these kind of fatty streaks in our blood vessels. And what happens is our blood vessels are supposed to be slippery slides. There should be nothing there. And what happens is as we develop fatty streaks, uh, that is pretty much the onset of cardiovascular disease. And so what happens over time is that inflammatory cells and calcium starts beginning to uh, add on to that little plaque. And once there's a tear or a break in that plaque that exposes it to blood cell products, and boom, you have your heart attack or stroke. So what are the risk factors that, that cause this? So I like to break it up between the factors that we can change and the factors that we can't change. And so what can't we change? Age. We can't change our gender, and it predominantly does affect males, although after menopause, women start matching the rates of males. Uh, and then we have family history. Uh, there's a lot of uh, factors that we have identified uh, that are hereditary, but there's also many that we, we don't know, um, and also race. Uh, there's a huge impact on different ethnicities and race on the development of heart disease. So what are some modifiable risk factors? Things that you can change. Smoking, physical inactivity. Uh, there's been multiple studies that shown uh, how even just increasing your activity to four days a week, 30 minutes at a time of aerobic exercise, really drops your risk by 50% of, of a fatal MI. Poor diet, I'll touch about that later. Obesity, high blood pressure, this is why having a visit with your primary care provider is really important because it is silent. I know people think, oh, I have to have a headache. If I have a headache, that means I have high blood pressure. That's not the case. It is a silent epidemic, and that's why you have to be screened. And that's why any office, you go to a plastic surgeon office or you go to ophthalmology, they're gonna throw a cuff on you because you know that increases your risk of surgery, uh, having an event during surgery, and it is silent. Uh, cholesterol, we know, we, uh, I know many of you guys know about the high and low uh, uh, cholesterol levels, but the problem is, is that this is modified towards your risk factor. So it's not, it's not enough to be reliant on the reference range of the blood sample because everyone has a different goal based on your risk factors. For example, if I have a diabetic, I'm gonna treat them a lot more aggressively uh, rather than someone who's 25 years old who has a, uh, a bad cholesterol of, of 150, per se. And diabetes is a huge factor. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have shown diabetics are pretty much as if they already have heart disease, and so we have to treat them aggressively for that. And then let's go on about the calcium artery, uh, coronary uh, artery calcium score. So these are sometimes advertised as heart scans. You might have seen some billboards, um, some magazine ads, all about these heart scans. They have some cool like graphics, um, and you know that admittedly kind of. You know, lights a you know a light in the head is like, is this a gimmick? You know, is this something that's trying to sell? Um, and it's not. There's a lot of studies recently that have shown that it's really important because it tells us if you have already have heart disease, um, and it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and it's it, it's able to tell us the extent of the plaque that you have in your in your heart, and it really adds to the assessment of your overall heart risk. 
So think of it as a way for us to take a look to see if you, if you already have heart disease. Risk factors all, are all can be calculated, but this will actually give us a look inside your heart. And so this is an example of a patient that had no cardiovascular risk factors. So if we, if we had seen him in clinic in the primary care setting, and I looked at his blood pressure and everything, I would be like, okay, go ahead, you're fine. But we got a calcium, artery, a calcium score on him, and he was over 400. And, and that is really significant, because any, any value over 400 tells us that your risk of developing a stroke or heart attack is imminent. And this would, again, this would not have been found if we had just done the traditional risk factor assessment. Um, this is another kind of uh, uh, breakdown of how we risk stratify you. Again, the most important thing here is zero. You know, if you have a zero calcium score, your risk is very low. And there has been multiple studies uh, that has shown that if we take someone with multiple risk factors, so they're diabetic, they have high blood pressure, they have really bad, calci uh, bad cholesterol levels, uh, but if they have a zero calcium score and you compare it to somebody that has no risk factors but has an elevated calcium score, they have a lower risk. So this is how important it is for us to get checked. So the next question is, when do we get checked? So based on the prominent studies that kind of fueled uh, the adoption of, of the coronary, LCM, uh, uh, coronary artery calcium score, we call it CAC. You know, more, uh, we're more familiar with the CAC score. Um, we, it mostly, we look at age of 40 for males and, and ages of 45 for females. But if you have any risk factors, it drops by five years. So if you have any risk factors, high blood pressure, and you know what includes one of those risk factors? Family history, race. Uh, even if one of them, we recommend males at 35, and females at 40. So who should not get tested? Is anyone that already has established heart disease. So if you have stents, you have bypass, you have a device, you're obviously pregnant, you don't want the radiation because it is still a CAT scan, um, then you're not a candidate. But at that point, we're, like if you have a history stents and you have a prior heart attack or stroke or your heart devices, we should be treating you aggressively anyways. It won't change management. But definitely think about 40 for females, 35 for males. Again, this is not covered by insurance, so a lot of what hospitals do, and this is all marketing, and we'll be honest with, transparent about it, they know there's so much disease in the community, in society, and so they really subsidize these testing. They offer it promotions like $49, 50 bucks. You should just uh, Google search to see what hospitals are offering that deal. You get it for 50 bucks, and you get a great look into what your risk is. That would already would be not captured by the, our traditional ways of calculating your risk. Again, I'm, this is just clarifying the importance of a zero calcium, that it trumps all other traditional risk factors. And now let's go into some recent data. So there's been a lot of back and forth throughout the years, what is the best diet? And how do we determine what a best diet is? You know, and so there is that really low uh, sugar phenomenon, low fat, phenomenon, get away from eggs, you know, all cholesterol's bad, you know, be vegan, be only plant-based. So there was a study in 2018 and 2020 that kind of looked at all these different fads, all these dietary fads. And they came up with um, a meta-analysis to look at all the, all the studies, and they, and, they, and, they've, and they also looked at all the quality of the evidence too. And pretty much this is the gold standard. This is what is shown to reduce risks of heart disease, strokes, cancers, and is the PESCO Mediterranean diet plus fasting component. So let's dive into this world of, of um, the PESCO Mediterranean diet. So it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's way more powerful than the many drugs that we use. Can you, can you imagine that? So the drugs that I use like statins, I give it all like, like water in my clinic. This is, more, this is more impactful than that. And it's all about the omega-3 fatty acids, the EPA and DHA. And these have remarkable um, kind of, they're, they're remarkable compounds that are scientifically pro proven to reduce the risk of inflammation. And that is the cornerstone of heart diseases, inflammation. And it also has, this diet also has a very robust uh, intake of fiber. Um, you know, that's all because of the fruits and vegetables and, and whole grains that it includes. And a lot of people think fiber digestion, but it's not. Fiber is our potent weapon 
against high cholesterol uh, levels, and it helps protect your blood vessels. So this is all from fiber, so I don't want people to think, so when I push like Metamucil in my clinic, they're like, oh, I don't have any problems with my BMs. But it's not about that. You know, it, it's, it has shown to really improve our blood, our blood vessels and, and protect us from really bad levels of, of high cholesterol. So how can this be in line with the Syrian food, right? So like that's the question, you know, like am I able to eat kubba, you know, am I able to eat dolma, you know, and you know, we are able to kind of marry it. We, we can align it with our dietary practices. Um, you know, so we could complement our Syrian cuisine, but while preserving its cardiac benefits. So what are some pluses about the Syrian cuisine? Well, we use a lot of fresh vegetables. We, lot, we use a lot of whole grains. We use legumes like lentils. That's really uh, predominant in our diet. Uh, but we do have to modify our diet a little bit. Uh, over, the, you know, over the recent centuries, you know, we have been a lot uh, really based on meat. We use a lot of meat in our diet. And so one way to kind of circumvent this is to buy, incorporate more fish and veggies into it. A good example is when we were in Iraq this past, uh, for the Gishu trip, we went during Soma, okay, Soma Rabba, which is, you know, 50 days. So we have a really elaborate cuisine for vegan food for 40 days. Uh, for, I'm sorry, for, for 50 days. And so we went into, we went into this church um, in Marnarse in Duhok, and they had this, uh, they had kubba, and I was like, dude, we can't eat this. This has, this has meat in there. I'm surprised that a church is offering kubba uh, during, you know, during Soma. So when I, when I kind of broke the kubba in half, it was not meat. So I, I asked them what they had included in it. They, it was mushrooms and walnuts. They, they had put wa walnuts and mushrooms within the kubba. Um, another dish, they had rice with what looked like pieces of meat, but it wasn't. It was, um, uh, it was like a mushroom that, that's found in northern Iraq. Um, what's, that? What's, a, what's a high level mushroom called? Uh, Shiitake. No, 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 no. Uh, like the ones, truffles. It was, it was a truffle that, that is native to northern Iraq. Um, so they use that as a meat substitute. So these are the things that we have to think about as a community uh, that to, to adopt our diet to be more, uh, to more fitting uh, for this kind of uh, uh, background. So again, it's also to limit the amount of red meat in processed foods. And, and why is that? Well, the processed foods are, are filled with ex excessive sodium, unhealthy fats, all right? and preservatives, which are notorious to kind of fuel uh, the, the, uh, a coronary disease. Um, and so when you're, when you're on this diet, it kind of is an anecdote to, to, those, uh, to those factors. Um, so now, the, now to kind of shift our focus um, on intermittent fasting. So this is kind of uh, having structured cycles of eating and fasting. And so why is this so important? It's because studies have shown that it enhances glucose metabolism. What do we talk about one of the main risk factors of heart disease? Diabetes. Um, and what's another major risk factor is abdominal, so fat. And so doing intermittent fasting actually targets both those things. It helps lower, uh, it, helps, it helps increase your insulin sensitivity, so you do a better job metabolizing glucose. It also reduces your abdominal fat. And so what does it look like? Um, so you could do it like 12 hours a day fasting um, and then 12, hour, 12 hours a day eating. So that means you have a window like that. Most of the data has shown to in increase the fasting period to about 15 hours or 14 to 15 hours and just in narrowing your window of eating at some parts of the day. So what I do personally, I just skip breakfast. So I stop eating after 10 p.m. Uh, I, I start eating the next day at noon. So basically, I start eating from noon to 10, and that's my window, and I stop eating after those hours. So, so that's how I do it. Um, I think I'm almost done. Oh, here. So I, you know, being a medical talk, I have to show some data, right? So, uh, so Pretty Med was a study in 2018 that was conducted in Spain in older adults. What did it show? Well, they didn't compare it to like a fast food diet or a junk diet. They compared uh, the Mediterranean diet with two other diets. One was a low-fat diet. This is the black line. So that was a low-fat diet. It was not even a bad diet, a low-fat diet. And then they had a Mediterranean diet with excessive nuts, and then a Mediterranean diet with excessive extra virgin olive oil. And what it showed was that we were able to drop the risk of heart attacks, strokes, and death combined by 
compared to a low fat diet, not even a regular diet, a low fat diet. And the extra virgin olive oil arm did a little better than the nuts arm. So what do I recommend to my patients right now that walk into my clinic? Get four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil every day in your diet. And how do you do that? By salad dressing, making your own salad dressing with extra virgin olive oil. So that's something very simple for us to incorporate. Um, and then share, share this message with your friends and family because we want more people to attend the convention and we need you guys to be healthy to do that. All right? Okay, so we could go ahead with a, a Q&A panel. We had a special requ request from one of my mentors, one of the original Assyrian people who advocates for health, and that is Dr. Samir Jonah. He had a couple of comments. So Dr. Samir, can you please join us? Well, actually, even after 40 years of doing this, I still learned a lot from those guys. So thank you very much. Most important of all, look at the monastery I created. I never thought I would be able to create such a monastery. Tiffany, thank you very much. You brought one thing I want to stress the fact on, and that's called rectal screening. Uh, I know nobody likes the, likes the winger fave, you know, the, the finger wave. Nobody likes it. But it's important. But one thing, colorectal cancer is one of the very few, few cancers in the body that is totally predictable. There is something called adenoma carcinoma syndrome, even the benign polyp. If you leave it behind, it will turn into cancer. It starts with adenoma, and then it goes from metaplasia, then dysplasia, and finally into neoplasia, which is the cancer. That's why we have to remove all. And it's been estimated that the time for that to turn into cancer is anywhere between two years to 10 years. If you live, then it will definitely turn into cancer. So pay attention to that, and don't be scared of us surgeons. We're nice people. We just use the nice one we have to. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, we'll open it up uh, to uh, question and answer from the public. Uh, and we'll be starting with the, we'll be starting the Nabu talks in uh, 10 minutes, okay? So we shifted from 2 to 2.30 Assyrian time. <laughs> Well, first of all, merci Rob Agadano Khun. Um, I'm Kristen Martan, and my question is, I know Richard spoke about the art and the science coming together. I also want to ask about the heart and the science coming together. So as physicians, you're all working with people on a daily basis for their health. So my question is, what are you each doing on a daily basis to make your patients feel more comfortable um, to come to a setting where they may be apprehensive because they are dealing with diseases and problems. Uh, what are you doing to kind of ease those concerns? Oh, okay, I'll go first. Um, that was a great question, thank you. Um, so the way I approach it is when I went into medicine, I just knew that I wanted to make sure to make some difference in as many people's lives as I could, but that even if I could make one difference in one person's life, it was worth it. But how I treat my patients, and they know this, my patients that are under my panel, is as if they're my own. I treat them as if they're my siblings, my parents, my grandparents, my family, how I would want to be treated. So I make it a very welcoming and warm environment. I'm pretty much the youngest in my group right now, so they know me as that young and energetic person that walks in. I always have a smile on my face, but I take the time to sit in the beginning, ask them their questions, and let them open up the forum before I sit there and start lecturing them about everything they need to do. <laughs> so I kind of have that shared um, opportunity with them. It's supposed to be a doctor-patient relationship. That is very important. You have to be comfortable with your doctor. We know this as physicians. If you're not, it will be very hard to kind of radiate what we want you to do for your health. Thank you. I have a question. Oh. Oh. My question is, my question is, what is the thing in the body or muscles or something in the body that makes the young guys very strong and by the passing years, the body gets weak? What is, the, what, why, why these things happen to to the body of the human being that was created by the, our Lord. I just want to know what 
makes the body strong and then gets weaker years after years? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, you know, they're all deferring to me, but I'm only in charge of one muscle in the body, and that's the heart. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of factors out there. Unfortunately, it's all genetic, and there's some, you know, things outside the scope of what I'm, what I'm able to talk about. But, uh, yeah, age kind of sucks. But um, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about it in detail. I don't know. Um, I mean, just briefly, he's right. I mean, cardiac health is extremely important, so that's why we had to defer to him. <laughs> but in general, he's correct about the age. So unfortunately, this kind of does hold against us, but that does not mean that you're not going to be healthy and you're going to automatically have aches and pains. The most important part, which is what we all kind of neglect when we're younger, is taking care of your body. So. It, we don't when we're young because we don't have any pain. We eat what we want. We're not going to, I mean, prior to me being a doctor, I mean, I love Panda Express. I could eat it all the time, but I don't because I know it's not good for me. Um, so you have to be cautious with your health, and exercise is the most important, whether that's swimming or walking. As we get older, our metabolism decreases significantly. So if we eat the same as, if I eat the same as I did last year and this year and my exercise doesn't change, I'm going to start to gain weight. I'm going to start to get aches and pains. Every year I get older, I push myself. I focus healthier on my diet. I exercise even harder than the year before. I think this is what will radiate that youth. And so that's the most important thing, diet and exercise. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for your time. Um, regarding diet, uh, I know that inflammation is like the big enemy. And when you look at a lot of like blue zones around the world, you know, places where they have the most people living over 100, they all, I think, don't drink coffee or, you know, they limit caffeine. But in America, we drink coffee and tea, you know, every morning. So what are, if you guys know, what are the effects of caffeine and cortisol and inflammation? And, you know, is that something we should kind of be looking to limit as Americans? Um, and, you know, is that kind of friendly to the diet you guys would recommend? You know, drinking, like, let's say, a cup of black coffee every day in the morning or tea. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this kind of goes back to the diet talk I had. Um, so it took a while for us to kind of get a conclusive, like, good study that kind of evaluated all the other studies that say what exactly is the best diet. It kind of, unfortunately, we're still in that phase of caffeine. There'll be always some trial or some study coming in that says caffeine's bad for you. The other one says, okay, it's okay to have like two cups. Or one that says, okay, if you have one cup a day, it keeps away colorectal cancer. So I mean, it's still unfortunately up in the air. We, we don't know. All I know is that excessive uh, use of caffeine is, is not good for you. Uh, for a cardiac standpoint, it does put you at risk for arrhythmias, which is our abnormal rhythms or fast, fast uh, rhythms of the heart. Um, so, like things that we don't know much about, because medicine is still in the frontier, we're still exploring things, we, it's not a conclusive field, uh, that's why it is an art, um, uh, I say in moderation. So uh, in moderation is what we kind of go back to when we don't have conclusive data. And Tanya agrees. Thank you. Caffeine does not affect the eyeballs, so I'm totally fine. You can drink whatever you want. It, it doesn't make noses smaller either, so. <laughs> And I have a confession. I drink a cup of coffee every day, and I might drink more. <laughs> Question for uh, Dr. Tiffany. Going back to the cancer screening, we have a number of uh, new non-invasive uh, methods, and I'd like to know your thoughts on those. For example, for colorectal cancer, there's Cologuard. Yeah. And then there's a company called Grail with a panel of 50 cancers called uh, Gallery. A uh, lot of literature on that. I'd like to know what you think. That's an excellent question. I think that was, was that Dr. Michael? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Michael. Um, OK, so I'm glad he brought this up, because this is part of the reason why I think some of my patients are hesitant. So 
there are different stool tests, as um, Dr. Michael mentioned. There's actually even one that's called the fecal occult stool test. Now, a lot of doctor's offices are ordering this. This is less, um, I guess, fancy than the ones he listed. Those ones are only picking up on microscopic blood that will pass on the stool. If it doesn't pass during that collection, it gets missed. Um, and other things can cause that too. It could be hemorrhoids even that you're not aware you might have internally. For the tests that um, he was referring to, yes, they do have some fancy tests that can detect a lot of these um, polyps that are in our colon because they're detecting it by the DNA. But the problem with these tests is when people are doing them, most of the time they'll think, oh, okay, it came benign or maybe there's a little bit of polyps. But until you get that colorectal screening test, there are very common complicated, subtle, and even flat polyps that are hard for some of the specialists to find. I mean, a well-trained GI specialist might actually struggle with finding these polyps, and they actually can be missed. I've seen this, unfortunately, happen to patients. So these little maybe more aggressive and hidden polyps may not be noted, and they'll be missed. And at the end of the day, even if that stool test is normal, which is rare, if it's testing the DNA of the polyps, these polyps need to come out. It doesn't matter if they're benign or not. These days, there's too many that are malignant. Um, Dr. Jonah mentioned earlier that uh, about the adenomas. That's absolutely correct. I'm seeing left and right people having tubular adenomas in their colons, and these can become very aggressive and absolutely will turn into cancer. All right, doctors, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate the talk. Uh, so my first question is for Dr. Nathan Abraham. Uh, I know you mentioned that you do LASIK surgery, but you didn't mention PR care, smile surgeries for my phobia. So what's your opinion on those two different surgeries? Excellent question. I actually offer LASIK and PRK. Smile, I'm going to start offering soon. Um, the difference between LASIK and PRK depends on how high the prescription is and how much corneal tissue we have to work with. So if it's a relatively high prescription and an average or below average thickness cornea, I don't have enough tissue to make a flap for LASIK. So PRK is basically LASIK, but instead of a flap, we just polish the surface of the eye. SMILE is a little bit different where we actually extract a small lenticle, that's what SMILE stands for, from the cornea to flatten it. So it just depends on when I see a patient, what are the measurements and what's the best option for them. But you're right, those are all great tools. Thank you so much. And then just one small question for Dr. Joseph. Uh, I really like filet mignon steaks, so what's your opinion? Like, should I cut it back, eat more fish, or chicken? So I practice in Northwest Indiana, you know, and they love their beef, all right? So they get it, like, right at their farm, you know, and so I'm, I'm always trying to battle with them on that. And so what I've come to, like, a good compromise is I say treat it like dessert. You know, like you don't have it every day of the week, but you know, if you have it once in a while, it's fine. But just don't make it part of your routine. You know, you should not have a routine based on meat. You know, meat should be seen as a delicacy. And so keep it that way. And so that's how I say, have your filet mignon, but don't have it every day, you know? You know, maybe, maybe keep it twice a month, or you know, if you're that of an addict, maybe once a week. But, but try to incorporate fish. And once you start looking into fish, and uh, salmon and sardines, and there's so many like uh, different types of tuna. Um, you know, you really broaden your palate, and then you live a much more healthier lifestyle. Yeah, uh, this is Samir Jonah again. Uh, in, in response to Dr. Michael's comment about some of those testings, I do that for my patients. We have genetic testing, we have 50 gene panels, we have 21 gene panels. Problem with these is that Oftentimes, it shows you have some genetic predisposition, but we do not understand the clinical significance of it. So all we create, if we order these testing, is we create a monkey jumping on your shoulder. I call these tests sometimes as, and I call these patients sometimes as victims of modern imaging technology, vomit. And this is, uh, yeah, this is actually, I didn't discover this term. It was published in 2002 by a neurosurgeon in England. So more testing does not translate into better care. We got to know the significance of that. And thank you. OK, thank you, guys. Um, let's give these doctors a big round of applause.
إمن وايلا أكسدن إتنراب ناشا ليطي مد بالسلطة قد شكلي إتلا نسيانة بدانا كيسس إت إنجري لوح و بيالباية قريمة إن آتن ينكل بدت بيتا خز موخن يطانة إتلوخن بوقارة مغبرون المنيان التلفون تمانية أربا شوا وچا تمانية تري وچا خمشا خا إشتا يان توخن بيت إنجري رايتس دا كام شمي إلى توني كالغراكس كيام زمن لشان خلية ديما Welcome to Assyrian National Council of Illinois. where we provide home care services for the elderly 60 years and older. For over 20 years, ANCI has worked closely with the state of Illinois to strengthen and expand our home care program. We currently service the Chicagoland area, including Cook, Kane, and DuPage counties. If you are interested in finding out more about our home care services, please visit us at our Chicago or Streamwood office.